FIFA is a cultural phenomenon. Quite apart from its namesake governing body that feels perpetually mired in corruption and negative headlines, the video game has spent three decades riding the wave of a booming medium to become as much a part of the sport it depicts as any club or player. This year though, EA Sports will release their latest instalment of the video game under a new name, after the end of their 30 year partnership with FIFA. But while this is seen by players, both digital and athletic, as the start of a new chapter, the one it closes is as incredible a story as football has ever told. This is how FIFA changed video games and football forever. Meet Tom Stone. Now a revered industry veteran, but 30 years ago recently appointed as EA's Vice President of European Marketing and assigned to the team working on the game. He still remembers the conversations inside the company ahead of the launch of the very first edition of FIFA, and they weren't overly positive. The Americans just didn't get it, he told 442's Chris Evans. They were like, soccer? What is that? They asked how many units this game was going to sell. They said football wasn't very popular, and we said, actually, it really is. In the end, even EA's European division, who'd argued the case for the creation of a football game, couldn't have envisaged quite how big their idea would become. While Stone and his colleagues were consciously searching for an evergreen franchise that would deliver big returns each year, in the same way as Madden NFL was doing in North America, they didn't foresee the global sensation that would follow. But following the game's first iteration, FIFA International Soccer, released on Sega Mega Drive in late 1993, the series sold more than 330 million copies and became the biggest selling sports video game franchise of all time. It was kind of a little play with soccer in the US, with the World Cup being held there in 1994, but there was little resource and frankly limited interest, and the game was very close to not being finished on time. They thought, let's get it out and forget about this thing, and kind of sleepwalked into a cultural phenomenon. It became so big that they had to make another one, and another one, and another one. Over time, it overtook Madden and became the game globally that everybody wanted to play. It wasn't an accidental success, but it also wasn't a million miles off that. The idea of a football game had first been suggested to EA in late 1991, after senior executive Mark Lewis identified a gap in the market. At the time, early 90s cult classic Sensible Soccer had yet to hit the shops, and while Match Day, Kickoff, and Emlyn Hughes International Soccer had earned some fans, no football game had yet been a huge hit. Despite the case that Lewis put forward, EA's US division were skeptical and felt football was too complicated to replicate in game form. They weren't entirely wrong with the technology back then making for one-dimensional gameplay that struggled to provide authenticity, most football games were relatively rigid and formulaic, lacking the fluidity of real life. But the team of developers and business brains working on the game's concept had a plan to stand out from the crowd. Gameplay would be improved by breaking the tradition of the era, shunning a bird's eye view, instead creating an angled shot from the corner of the stadium to show more of the pitch and make the players seem 3D. Madden had a similar 45 degree view, and that was one of the two things that allowed FIFA to break through, Stone tells 442. The other was the licensing strategy we pursued, signing up FIFA as a license partner. The 1993 game bore the FIFA name, but didn't include real players, clubs, or domestic leagues. Instead, it was a purely international affair, with fake named identical players filling the squads of 48 national teams from around the world, including the powerhouses of Hong Kong, Iraq, and Luxembourg. Tony Gubber provided commentary on the PC CD-ROM version, although it was on the Mega Drive that it really took off. EA's target of selling 300,000 copies in Europe, a figure that was considered ambitious, was smashed within weeks in the UK alone. More than half a million copies were sold in the first month of release in Britain, with FIFA International Soccer remaining at the top of the gaming charts deep into 1994. But already, work to make the second version of the game even better was well underway. One of Stone's main jobs was to secure the licensing deals from all over the world to allow FIFA 95 to feature all the major clubs. By the time FIFA 96 was released, it included the real names of the players too. EA Sports' slogan was, if it's in the game, it's in the game, Stone says. And that led to me getting on a plane with two other people, flying around the world and trying to sign every single league we could. We had a relationship with FIFA, but the last two letters of their name were an indication of what rights they actually had. F*** all. They had nothing, so we helped them to organise and make the leagues realise that they had rights. 
rights to stadiums, player rights, player likeness rights, apparel rights and the league structure. I flew to Italy, to Spain, France and Denmark, we did the MLS in North America and also the J-League in Japan. What made FIFA a success was that it ended up being a really compelling game experience. Quickly, the marketplace was also filling up with a host of other football titles. But the credibility that naming rights provided meant EA Sports offering grabbed the attention, even if some other games had edged ahead of FIFA in the gameplay stakes. Despite that early success though, the relationship between EA Sports and football's governing body wasn't always smooth. The value of FIFA's endorsement clearly hadn't gone unnoticed. No partnership was sacred if the potential for a better deal was on the table elsewhere. It was awkward because the only thing they wanted to talk about was, how much money are you going to give us, Stone adds. There was very little discussion about building a long-term partnership, which is what I wanted to do from a commercial standpoint. We didn't know quite how successful the game was going to become, but we had a sense that this thing could be pretty cool. Our position was that we wanted to be a good long-term partner with FIFA, but they never responded. I did once say that it was like dating a girl you think is wonderful, but you also think she's not saying very much, or I don't know where I stand. But I did find out though, because I got a call from someone at Sony in 1996. He said, you and I need to talk. I met him and he said FIFA are out shopping the license. He told me FIFA had approached Sony and asked if they'd be interested in taking the rights exclusively. This potential disaster was averted though before EA Sports cemented their relationship with the release of FIFA Road to World Cup 98. As anyone of a certain age will remember, this featured David Beckham on the cover in the UK. A fine tournament lay ahead for Bex where surely nothing could go wrong. Yep, we'll just skip that clip, thanks very much. And the French version starred David Ginola who didn't even make the World Cup at all. With Raul and Paolo Maldini chosen in Spain and Italy respectively, it was one of the first examples of EA's new strategy to create a series of localised covers targeted at different nations. Before that, the very first cover shots captured in-match action, spawning some unlikely protagonists. For FIFA 93, that meant Polish journeyman Peter Swierzewski made an appearance on the cover alongside England star David Platt. A year later, it was former Spurs goalkeeper Eric Tordzvet diving to make a spectacular save. Then, perhaps most random of all, Notts County long throw merchant Andy Legg on the cover of FIFA 96, attempting a sliding tackle on Brescia's Sabao during the Anglo-Italian Cup final. From the late 2000s, there was more of a negotiation with players, but what helped was that by that point, FIFA was such a behemoth that it was an honour to be on the cover, says author Price. You see, players debating their stats on the game and checking their likenesses, but although being on the cover wasn't quite the Ballon d'Or, it was one of the ultimate achievements as a footballer to say you'd made it. What a power that is for a video game. But the game wasn't just about the on-pitch stars. Over the years, getting on the FIFA playlist became a huge deal for musicians of all statuses, and was credited with elevating the careers of several artists. Songs became synonymous with individual editions of the game, with the mere mention of certain tracks enough to automatically transport some players back to a particular year spent bashing controllers. When you think back to FIFA 98 and having Blur's song 2 on repeat, I love that song because of FIFA, Price reminisces. And there are so many people who say the same about different songs. One of the best stories was that EA Sports basically discovered Avril Lavigne. One of her first gigs was in EA Sports Canteen trying to impress the music guy they'd hired, because they'd realised having a soundtrack just elevated the authenticity and feeling of the game. So they did this deal to put Complicated into FIFA 2003. The Song 2 deal was rather more unconventional. Sean Ratcliffe, who became the head of EA Sports Europe, called Blur just as they were about to go on stage in Australia. He said to them, we want Song 2, what can we give you? Damon Albarn replied, we've got more money than we know what to do with, but what we can't get is tickets to the World Cup final. EA Sports could, at the time, obviously get those, so they secured four tickets for the 1998 final, and the deal was done. A relationship with Robbie Williams sprang up for FIFA 2000, when he was interviewed on his way out of that year's Brit Awards, having just won Best British Single, Best British Video, and Best British Male Solo Artist. Asked, what are you going to do now? He replied, I'm going home to play FIFA 99. EA immediately contacted his people to ask if that was true, and when they were told it was, a meeting was set up to discuss a relationship. William's song, It's Only Us, then became the theme music for the 2000 version in exchange for his beloved Port Vale being included in the game. FIFA may have had the star quality, but that didn't always guarantee the game's position as the number one football sim. 
A contender to that crown came in the form of Pro Evolution Soccer, or PES, created by Japanese development company Konami. While PES couldn't come close to matching FIFA for its licensing, it's affectionately remembered for team names such as Merseyside Red for Liverpool and players like Roberto Larcos instead of Roberto Carlos, its gameplay was considered to more than have the edge on that of FIFA. PES felt like football, whereas FIFA felt a bit more kick and run back then, according to Steve Merritt who ran PES's PR in the UK between 2002 and 2019. FIFA was very lightweight at the time and PES had physicality to it. It was a slower game, but that made it feel more precise and tactical. There were also little things like the way players received the ball. In the early games, when you had Gaza or Beckham in it, there was a slight difference to the way they played, whereas all the FIFA players were just identical. Konami, of course, weren't the only ones to notice the difference. I shouldn't really tell you this, but during lunch times when we had a break, we'd play PES. We wouldn't actually play FIFA, confides Stone. You have to acknowledge it, otherwise you're not dealing with reality, and the reality was that PES was an outstanding game. We had to pull our socks up and say, what can we learn from this? In its heyday, PES was consistently selling between 7 and 9.5 million copies for each edition, and developing a huge following, particularly in the UK. The glory days of PES were overseen by a guy called Seabass Takatsuka, and he was the guy who took it from PlayStation to PlayStation 2, but he left around the time it went to PlayStation 3, explains Merritt. PS3 was an awful time for PES. They brought in this new development team that claimed they were going for realism, but all they were really going for was realism of faces. Around the time of PES 2007, it became this really tedious game where all the midfield nuance and individuality was taken for pace. That drop in quality coincided with FIFA doing what Konami had been doing before, so it was almost as though they swapped ethos. Opposition now vanquished, EA Sports continued to develop FIFA. Advances in technology only made innovation more possible. They toyed with cult spin-off FIFA Street in 2005 before rebooting it to more success in 2012. They brought in FIFA's player career mode where you could play as one individual and added another dimension with the Journey trilogy, an immersive story focused on fictional starlet Alex Hunter. The pièce de résistance though came with the creation of FIFA Ultimate Team, where gamers collected packs of players to build a world-beating team from scratch. Ultimate Team revolutionised the gaming experience, becoming a cash cow for FIFA thanks to its in-game purchases and introduction of a new fantasy aspect. The advent of super-fast broadband all over the world also mushroomed the online play modes, with Ultimate Team becoming the perfect grounding for players from around the globe to test their skills against others. It became the mode of choice for the booming market of professional FIFA competitions, with football clubs recruiting gamers to represent them in lucrative events. The prize money on offer started to run into six figures for the bigger tournaments, streamed by millions of esports fans and even broadcast on TV by Sky. It became a big business, and while there were stories of casual FIFA players upsetting the order to beat the pros at top events, elite online competition became principally the realm of well-backed teams packed with full-time players. That wasn't the case when David Bythway, the first British FIFA player to sign to a professional club when he joined Wolfsburg in 2016, was plucked from his bedroom in Wolverhampton to play the game on the world stage. I went to the interactive World Cup that was hosted in Brazil in 2014, Bythway explains. The experience was amazing. Me and a friend flew out to Rio, landed at 6am, but couldn't go to bed because the FIFA rep said there was filming to do on Copacabana Beach. That night we were taken to a rooftop bar above the beach when all of a sudden, the crew of Match of the Day came in. One moment we're just sitting, looking out, then we turn around, and Gary Lineker, Alan Shearer and a lot of them are walking towards us. The final itself was held on top of Sugarloaf Mountain and the Brazilian Ronaldo was there. He came to shake my hand before the final and wish me good luck. It was crazy. After 30 years though, the relationship between FIFA and EA Sports is over unable as they were to agree a new deal to extend their partnership following a breakdown in negotiations. EA Sports FC 24 retains all of the gameplay and licenses of the previous games, just without the FIFA name. The governing body says it plans to release its own game next year to now rival EA. I'm so proud of my ex-colleagues from EA who said to FIFA, our game is bigger than you, and while we'd love to work with you, the rights exist in the local leagues, Stone tells 442. FIFA are now back to 1993, where they have no rights to anything apart from the World Cup. While EA Sports game will broadly stay the same, the divorce brought the curtain down on one of football's most iconic partnerships, ending an era that played such a big part in so many people's lives. 
It's an era that may not have happened at all had EA's skeptical bigwigs not been swayed 30 years ago. Soccer? What is that?